You're listening to Straight Out of Whack. Kobe Knox, the fail. Bella Earl, that's where she's special and one. Through his legs for Mike P. Oh my. Three for the lead. Got it. Lamar Wilkerson with 1.3 left to go. Here's your host, Kyle McDonald. What's up, everybody? Another episode of the Straight Whack Podcast. We're going to do a little video podcast today uh, because I have a special guest. I, I think I need to rethink my intro now that uh, one of the clips is of a team who is no longer playing basketball this season. And I probably should have put another sport in this with my special guest today. Utah Valley baseball head coach Eddie Smith joins me from, I'm assuming, the UCCU ballpark in Orem right now. That's right, Kyle. Pumped to be on. It's game week, so really excited to start the week right here. Absolutely, absolutely. The Wolverines open up February 17th, a five-game uh, series against UC at UC Davis. Eddie, you're in your second season at Utah Valley. Your team, I, I believe I read right, hit the most home runs since 2010 of any Utah Valley baseball team. Uh, you raised your RPI 84 spots. Uh, just maybe talk about the first season in Orem. Uh, it took over a program that hasn't been real good since 2016 when they won the WAC. Just kind of the – maybe the progress you saw in year one. Well, there was some progress for sure, Kyle. And uh, you mentioned some of the numbers there, whether it was the home runs hit, uh, you know, the boost in the RPI, um, you know, the the – win total almost doubled and um you know i think there's one metric out there that listed us as the 21st largest turnaround of any program in division one baseball last year which is a good place to be there's no doubt about that that's the trend you want to be on but uh, we also have a long way to go and um you know year one was a step that we needed to take and uh, now we headed into season two and i feel really excited about the direction we're going and um you know you look back at year one there were highlights along the way of a season that you know, brought plenty of headaches. Uh, the highlights were along the way. Um, you know, I, I look back at a midweek series sweep over UNLV, who went on to win the Mountain West Conference. Uh, we were able to win a game against Pac-12 Utah and split a series with them. Um, we won two games against ranked teams. And, and those are the things that really kind of stand out. Uh, two of our players then went on to get opportunities to play in the Pioneer League, play professional baseball. So there were some really, really cool bright spots in that season. How do you get that consistency? Like you said, you swept UNLV, split with Utah. But how, I think, you know, covering Utah Valley baseball for, oh, what is it, 2023, eight? I mean, I haven't covered the last couple of years, you know, officially, but, like, I pay attention. Um, but how do you get that consistency where – you don't have maybe one big series where you, you, like you said, you swept UNLV, but then you fall off maybe in another series that you probably should win. And so like, how do you figure out that consistency in that regard? Oh, I think that's all comes down to recruiting and personnel. Um, you know, it's really hard to outplay your talent. Uh, that's just the reality of college athletics period. And in baseball, it's no different, particularly in pitching. Uh, when you pitch and defend, I don't care how offensive your ballpark might be. I don't care how offensive your conference might be. Uh, when you can go out there and pitch and defend, you give yourself a chance to win a game every single time you take the diamond. And we play the most unpredictable sport out there. Um, it's a sport where you'll see the worst team in the league beat the best team in the league annually. And um, it's something where because of that unpredictability, we got to strive for consistency because when you are consistent, and you go out there and pound that door every single day, that door falls down for you more often than not. And uh, you got to have the players to be able to do that. And you got to have an approach where you go out and get that, uh, you know, that aggressive kind of effort every single day out of the team. And that's what we're shooting for. Come over from LSU last year, your first year in Orem. Maybe talk about the drastic difference and maybe landscape. Is it prettier? <laughs> I, I'm not going to say it's prettier. It's the best backdrop in college sports to have snow-capped mountains that you can look at every day from your office um, and that guys get to see as they're hitting 
compared to maybe what you had in Baton Rouge, right? Like it's just, it, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, we're, we're trying to kind of get that phrase going a little bit right now. Baseball's best backdrop because it is that good. I mean, okay. There's a, a stadium in Venezuela that's right on the ocean that, okay, maybe we could have an argument, but after that, there is no argument. It is baseball's best backdrop. And, uh, it's an amazing place to come to work every day. Every day is a little bit different, whether it's snow capped or just kind of dusted with snow or in the fall, you have the changing of the leaves, uh, the way the sun hits it, the way the clouds are forming every day is different. And it's, uh, it's just amazing coming to this office, coming to this ballpark every day. What did you know about Utah Valley before you took over the job? Not a lot. Uh, I was coaching at Santa Clara university in 2012 I was on a team where we had a weekend series at BYU. A high school friend of mine actually was attending Utah Valley at the time. And he picked me up um, after our BYU Santa Clara game. And we went to dinner and we drove by the ballpark here, now UCCU ballpark. Um, and the ballpark was impressive and it was impressionable. I remember that moment very well. Little did I ever think that I'd be coaching here one day. Um, and, and I really didn't know a whole lot about the program. I didn't know a whole lot about the university. I had remembered the ballpark, but there has been so many changes since 2012. And so um, I was starting almost from scratch and understanding this university when I first started uh, going through the interview process in 21. You're part of a, I want to say a, a new group of coaches, I guess you could say under athletic director, Jared Sumption with you. Uh, with Mark Madsen, um, Kyle Beckerman. Um, I feel like there's a name I'm leaving off. Uh, you know, Chris LeMay was here when Jared took over, but still, I mean, it's kind of a new, I don't a new breed, I guess, new mentality. I feel like with we want to win and we want to win now with the coaches that are here. Do you kind of have that mindset or is it kind of like, okay, this is, we know we're just going to take some time. So just be patient with us for a minute. Oh, I don't think patients in college athletics go uh, hand in hand in a conversation. Uh, it's now time. It's now time. That's a mantra we have with our team every day. Hey, today's the most important day of the year. Let's go get after it. Let's get better today. Uh, we'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Um, you know, I think that the current state of college athletics, um, it, it demands and it is set up for a day to day, year to year type of a plan more than it's ever been before. Uh, whether you want to talk about the transfer portal or graduate transfers, still the COVID year impacting that a little bit. Uh, you know, we got to go out and put a team together every single season to be successful. And of course, there's a little bit of forecasting into the future, like there always has been in college athletics. Um, there's program building. There is um, projection in some of your players, especially the young ones. But the biggest priority, and we're no, uh, we definitely don't try to keep this any secret, is we want to win and we want to win right now. So um, we think we can do that here. We think we can do that at a quicker pace than ever before. And I think it's critical that we do that so that, uh, you know, we can get this, uh, the the momentum rolling for this program. I want to make it note, Eddie is a big hoops fan. He has hit me up multiple times on Twitter through a DM just saying, you know, he appreciates the coverage. But uh, speaking of hoops, you were there on Saturday night at the UCCU Center big rivalry. I, I don't, it's not a, people will think it's, it's not a big rivalry because there's not, you know, a hundred years of tradition, but you were there, you, you saw it. And there, that's Southern Utah, that basketball game is going to turn into a rivalry. I feel like, and your baseball guys were sitting <laughs> down there in the student section, heckling the, the SUU bench the entire game. What an atmosphere. Oh my gosh. Uh, just an awesome game, awesome atmosphere, great win. Um, you know, I, I, I walk right out my back door in my office and many, many times I'll see those lights on in that basketball office uh, at the most obscure times of the day or the weekend. And uh, it's no accident what they're doing right now. And uh, I think that Saturday night's game, that was kind of a culmination of a lot of work, uh, just a big, big marquee moment for this season. And gosh, that atmosphere is what you dream of in college athletics. And um uh, Gosh, our, our guys loved it. They were talking about it the next day at practice, and we talked about it as a team at practice of, 
hey, this is what we're doing this work for in the preseason right now so we can maybe share a moment like that if we continue to progress and develop and get better every single day. Do you like – so people may not know this. The UCCU ballpark followed what BYU did a couple years ago and got a turf field, entirely turf field. Now it makes that you could play games earlier than usual with that. Do you like the turf or would you prefer it to be more natural with the dirt and the grass? And like, yeah. I guess there's pluses and minuses to it, right? Uh, there, there's some pluses and minuses, but I would tell you that there's about a hundred pluses for every minus uh, in college baseball. Uh, when we're talking about the limitations we have with, uh, NCAA practice hours, class schedules, and trying to navigate how to run a program um, on a schedule, having a turf surface in any climate um, other than maybe Phoenix, Arizona, or San Diego, California, um, it, it's so critical because it allows you to focus on being a baseball coach. And it doesn't put you in a position where you're depending on too many people to do their job so that you can go practice. And that's a really, really important thing. And what that turf allows us to do here in Utah this time of year, I mean, shoot, the last two weekends, we've had three scrimmages each day or each weekend and uh, really replicating the season. That wouldn't be thought of if it was still a natural surface. And so what that brings for us here is just uh, countless and all the advantages that come along with it. And we're really fortunate to have it for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's a... It's a game changer, and I believe they did it to the softball field too, if I remember right. So it's a huge benefit for Utah Valley baseball. I want to ask you about a couple of guys uh, that their name keeps popping up when I ask questions about the program. Uh, Logan Gerling, the U Washington transfer. I'm assuming he's going to be one of your weekend starters. Uh, maybe he's starting you're opening one. day. He's starting on opening day for us. Yeah. Logan's uh, Logan's awesome. Um, brings a ton of maturity to us. Uh, he's now six years removed from high school, as so many college baseball players are right now in this COVID transfer uh, world that we're living in. Uh, he brings Pac-12 weekend starting experience to our program. Uh, just a maturity about him that uh, our other guys can build off of, and I think it's going to give us a chance to go out there and go compete every Friday night, which is everything. Is it more about – when you look at starting pitching in college baseball, is it about – I don't know what the word is. It's so – the game's changed a little bit since I was fully covering it. But, like, does, is it about the arm strength? Is it about stamina? Is it, I mean, it's got to be all, all of it, right? Yeah, it's a combination of it all, for sure. Uh, you know, you look at – uh, you, you look at, hey, what makes a good basketball player? Well, there's a lot of ways to do that. You know, you can be a great shooter. You could be a great scorer around the rim, um, you know, play great defense, change shots, whatever it might be. It's the same thing as a pitcher. And, uh, you know, I'd say Logan's specialty is that he is above average in just about everything that he does. Um, you know, in the college game, velocity has spiked much like it has in the professional game used to be that if you touch 90 miles an hour, you were a unicorn. And I think we had 13 guys touch 90 miles an hour for us this fall. Um, just to give you a perspective of how common it now is, the training that's available, uh, the science, the information, uh, it, it's everywhere. And, and Logan's edge is that he's just slightly above average in velocity, slightly above average in command, slightly above average in multiple pitches. Um, you know, and I'd even say probably even more than slightly above average in his ability to just manage a game. He doesn't let anything get to him. Um, he's just had a very, very successful career dating all the way back to high school where he's a pitcher and he gets out. And some guys just have that innate ability. Uh, maybe it's, you know, the, the guy that's a receiver with some pretty good skills, but man, he just always gets open. That's what Logan is as far as his ability to just get outs. Yeah. I think that's a unique trait. I, I don't want to say unique trait, but something that is missed is just, you don't have to be overpowering. Just get people out, like you said. I mean, the, use your stuff well. I, I'm one of those old school guys that hates when pitchers nibble at things like attack hitters. Like, go get them. And I'm I'm assuming that's what Logan's going to bring for you. Yeah, there, there's no question. I think you look at it, and I think he's something like eight strikeouts to every walk um, in in all of our scrimmages that we've had in our ten weeks of preseason fall in in January. Um, 
you know, it, it's something where he has a statistical history of doing that in college baseball. And we're just hoping that that continues. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to talk about maybe his battery mate, Burt Camper, that you brought in from to Towson. Excuse me. The guy hit 10 home runs last year. He's yeah. going to add to your basically your offensive approach, but what is he going to bring maybe experience-wise to, to your pitching staff? Yeah, Burke has just been uh, a presence that when you're talking about trying to build a program, I think every program that I've been around in the rebuilding phase um, has kind of been identified by a person or a couple of people that really elevate that stuff. yellow brick road of what that might look like, but ultimately it's a player or a small group of players that leads the locker room to have that standard be held. And Burke Camper is that guy for us. Um, you know, unfortunately we had a, a little setback, a major scare. We thought he may have torn his ACL. The initial test thought there was an ACL tear, but uh, it turns out it was a meniscus. Um, he's on the path to recovery. He'll be limited early on in the season, but there's a lot of hope that by the back half of the season, this will be such an afterthought that we won't even remember it. Um, but the amazing thing about Burt Camper is that um, while he's not able to participate right now physically at full speed, uh, he's still there every single day, and it's like having another coach. I mean, gosh, there's all this talk about how baseball needs another coach, needs another coach, and we got Burt Camper, okay? And, uh, um, you know, I can't wait till he's back to full speed as a ball player, too, because he was our best catcher. He was our best hitter and he was our best leader in the fall. Pretty darn good combination. And uh, really, really excited about what he's bringing this team. I, I want to make note that uh, Eddie's assistant, Nate Rasmussen, uh, is a Bingham alum. And uh, his dad, Rand, um, one of the best. My dad actually coached with Rand and I believe coached Nate while he was at him as well so there's a little bit of tie-in here kind of a small world uh but eddie what are you what are you kind of looking for in year two i, I know that you talked about uh still maybe some growing pains and things like that but like what are you looking forward to in year two uh challenging schedule to say the least um you know the wax getting better in baseball you got grand canyon with a couple all americans um sam houston in their final year you know got some ball players there what are you what are you looking forward to in year two Oh, you bring up some great points. I mean, the jump that the WAC has made um, over the last couple of years in baseball has been absolutely astronomical. Uh, last year, the WAC finished with third best RPI of any conference uh, in the western part of the U.S. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I think from my perspective, year two, just want to have uh, an infusion of talent that will lead to more success on the field. I want to have a giant leap in our culture, our culture of toughness, our culture of team, our culture of being together. Um, we've seen that. We've seen that. We've seen that. Now the reality is now we're in the spring. When you play that spring season, about the only thing that's guaranteed is adversity. And when things get real, that's when we'll see what we're really about. And so really excited to see how this group responds to that. I think we've done a nice job of working to build that foundation to stick to our core values, play hard every day, play for each other. Um, and I think we have a, a nice improvement in talent where you're going to see that combination all play together. And, um, you know, the results are results. Uh, they're a result of our preparation. I think we've put that preparation in. So really excited to get after it on that side of things. I want to ask you one last question before we go. How do you feel about guys playing summer ball, uh, getting, you know, invited to different leagues around the country? Um, you know, is that something that uh, some coaches don't necessarily like it because they don't want their guys to go get injured? But, like, how – I mean, you've been around the baseball world for a long, long time. You've been at big programs and so forth. But, like, how do, how do you approach that? Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think every player is in a different situation. And um, I think that the summer ball for collegiate summer leagues has really changed over the years. Uh, there's people all over the country popping up teams left and right because it's become a very good source of revenue and a way to make some money. And I don't blame them. Um, you know, as those leagues pop up, the quality of competition, uh, it's been spread out a little bit. Um 
but there are still some very good leagues out there. I mean, we tell our players, if you have a chance to play in Cape Cod or if you have a chance to play on Team USA, I don't care how many um, games you played in the spring, you're going to go pursue that opportunity because that might be the biggest honor you ever get in your baseball career. It's amazing. Um, you know, with that said, I think that this is a theme around a lot of college programs is we really try to structure our fall season to be a season where we try to create a lot of competition. Uh, we know that the competition level in our fall season is going to be better than summer baseball, uh, unless you're playing in the Cape Cod League or for Team USA. And we're going to have more professional scouts at our games in our fall season when we're scrimmaging. And so um, for a player who's played a substantial amount for us, we want them to go spend the summer, go to the beach and be a kid for two weeks or so. <laughs> and then get in the weight room. We've got an amazing advantage here. We have our own baseball strength coach that uh, we saw as a big, big need for us after last season. Our coaching staff all pulled together and said, hey, we're willing to sacrifice um, X, Y, and Z personally in order to fund this position. And it's been a game changer for us. And we've got a culture now created where, hey, we had players reaching out to us saying, hey, we want to work out, but we didn't have the situation for them to work out. And now we do. And we really want that summertime to be a focus for our guys to prepare themselves for fall, which prepares themselves for the season as a general rule of thumb. Now, with that said, there's going to be a handful of players that are in a developmental stage of their career. And maybe they only play 15, 20 games as a position player, or maybe they only throw 10 innings as a pitcher. And in those cases, we'll probably work to get them opportunities to go play a little bit in the summer, maybe half of a season in the summer, maybe a full season in the summer. So again, it's just an individual uh, situation for everybody. And uh, we try to have that conversation with the players and have them understand, hey, this is going to help your development best going this route or that route. I like the the thought on getting guys in the weight room and getting big, you know, stronger and things like that. I think that was a a thing that really kind of stuck out at Utah Valley, you know, with the baseball program over the years, at least when I see them playing against BYU and I see how much bigger the BYU guys are than Utah Valley guys. So it, I like that approach. I think that's a huge, like you said, a game changer in, in reality to, to have that strength coach that guys come in and work with. So, um, yeah, Eddie, anything, any reason for number 55 or was that just what was available for you? <laughs> Oh, you'll love the story. My freshman year of high school, um, you know, I was freshman on the bottom of that totem pole. There's probably, you know, 50 players or something in the program on varsity and JV ahead of me. Uh, one big set of uniforms for the whole program. And so the numbers were pretty limited at the time. And uh, it was right in the heart of uh, Jason Williams um, getting after it for the Sacramento Kings. Okay. And um, I mean, I think it was like 55. 48, 28, I mean, the numbers left were not exactly, uh, you know, fighting over number seven or, you know, number 23. Um, it, it was pretty limited. So I just grabbed it because it was sitting there and we went undefeated that year. So I just stuck with that number ever since uh, when I've had the choice. Nice. And I, I'm assuming that 55 has been available most places you've been at because, like you said, that's kind of a, a rare it's number to get to in a jersey. Yeah, it's a, it's almost always available, uh, except for, you know, at the junior college level, uh, when I was playing, they just didn't have a uniform set that had that many uniforms in it. Oh, so I had to settle uh, at that point. But other than that, I don't have to fight people off for it. And that's good, too. I don't want to take a player's number away from them. Well, there's another uh, 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 another really good basketball player at Utah Valley that wears number 55. So maybe it'll rub off with some uh, – so uh, good luck for you this year. I'll tell you what, I'm I'm telling you, I, I'm hoping they could throw as much luck over here that uh, they possibly can. But uh, again, I don't I don't think there's much luck involved. I think it's them working their tails off for a really long time, being intelligent, being bright about how they run their program and getting after it. I'll also tell you that that number 55 jersey might be a little bit long on me. I don't know. I'm not quite a seven footer. <laughs> that is probably true. That's probably true. Eddie Smith, Utah Valley baseball head coach, second year. Wolverines get started on Friday at UC Davis. And then their home opener, they end the month of February at home against BYU. That 
I guess I'll I'll ask you one last question about it. How do you like that series, dude? That that I mean, we see what it is in basketball. We see what it is in soccer or in women's soccer. Like, that's got to be a fun game for you. Well, I think what I found to be so fun about it is there's so much excitement about it around campus and around town. Uh, you know, as a coach, you sit there and. I know this is something that most people just say, hey, it's coaches talking, but there's a reality of, hey, when it's come time to play the game, you're so much more focused on your own team. You're so much more focused on you don't care about what that jersey says in the other dugout. You just want to find a way to score one more run than that other team does. But the fact that, you know, last year the president came out and threw out the first pitch and we probably had 2,000 people in the stands. Um you know, we had cleaning crews out here for a whole week getting this field ready to go for that game. It's a big deal around here. And yep. uh, we want to make sure that we can do everything we can to put a product out there where, um, hey, maybe that kind of excitement around our program could be something that becomes the norm and not just for the BYU game. But to see a glimpse of what that could be, it's really exciting. It's really encouraging. And so it's great to have them on the schedule. I appreciate, uh, you know, Trent Pratt uh, wanting to get us on the schedule. We've got an agreement where we're going to now play three times a year uh, with the proximity, the convenience. It's a no brainer uh, to get to play them this year twice at home. Uh, just a cool thing for the community. That's awesome. A two for one with the Cougars at UCCU ballpark. You love, love to see it. Eddie's for the time. And uh, we'll be talking more as we get into this baseball season and basketball season starts winding down. Like I said, there's some big things coming for Whack Hoops Digest, Straight Out Whack Podcast. And Eddie, again, thanks for the time and safe travels this weekend. Thanks, Kyle. You have a good one. And thanks for all you do. Thanks for listening to the Straight Out of Whack podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcasting platforms. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Remember to follow us on Twitter at Whack Hoops Digest and Facebook under Whack Hoops Digest for all your Whack Hoops news and information. <laughs>